Okay, guys, you are beautiful, but I must admit the background is even prettier. But anyway, so thanks to Take Me Outside and the Outdoor Learning Store for inviting me to do the presentation, and especially to Jade who did the outreach. So my talk tonight is on race and nature in outdoor education. Start off with, take a look around the room. Take a note of who is present. Yeah, short person syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so take a note of who is present. And now, take a note of who is absent. This is what I see. I see a room full of people who are passionate about outdoor education. They eat and drink the climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, and they are coming up with creative challenges on how to deal with these issues. On top of that, they have to inspire their students and give them hope that there is a tomorrow, and that hope is so critical. But when I look around the space, most of the people are white. Black people care about the environment and about outdoor education too. We always have and we always will. But here, it's our absence that I notice. When one group is present and another one is absent, it means that race is in the room. Now, as Canadians, we're nice and polite and we don't like to talk about race. And somehow we seem to think that it is rude. Well, race is right here with us in this room. It's the elephant in the room, or more appropriately, it's the moose in the room, or it's the woolly mammoth in the room to keep in with our ge geography and our climate as a land of the great outdoors. How many ways does race show up in outdoor education? Let me count the ways, but I'm only gonna do five. <laughs> There's a time limit. One, it's spring. And in the city, the sign of spring is the tulips and the daffodils. And I have them planted in my garden too. But as lovely as the tulips and the daffodils are, they are not native to Canada. They arrived here with the white settlers. Yet tulips and daffodils are so normalized as spring flowers that it seems mad to question their existence. But why do we plant millions of these bulbs and make them the icon of spring flowers, as opposed to, say, for example, native trilliums? What about the bloodroot? What about the wild strawberry? What about the prairie smoke flowers? They're all there, but we automatically go for tulips and daffodils. Colonialism takes many forms, and in the gardens, in outdoor education, it shows up as ecological colonialism. Here's a second way that race and nature are linked in outdoor education. How many of us tell our students to go into the backyard to collect a leaf, a seed, some soil, or to see which birds are hanging out there? How many of us do that as educators? Backyards are really important places to learn, but what happens if you don't have a backyard? Black people, other poor people, racialized people, are more likely to live in apartments. No backyards, no front yards either. Richer people are more likely to live in houses with backyards. And in Canada, the richer people are more likely to be white. It makes sense as educators to keep the backyard exercise, but we need to add collecting the leaf from a city park or a schoolyard to make sure that those who don't have backyards are actually included in the exercise. Now, there's a third way that race and nature are linked in outdoor education. How many of you take your students to the farm? Okay, a few of you. And in Toronto, the farms are those green spaces that we have. And they are really important in terms of letting students know where our food comes from and also what meat looks like on legs. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Students in Toronto are more likely to see virtual cows than an actual cow. But race shows up on the farm too. The typical farm animals are your pigs, your cows, your sheep, your horse. None of those species are native to Canada. 
So when they are normalized as your typical farm animals, once again, we are verifying settler colonialism in the form of ecological colonialism. And when we think of the farmers, the farmers are white, the farm workers are black and brown. So even in the production of our foodstuff, race is also part of that conversation. There's a fourth way that race and nature are linked in outdoor education. Now, parks like this, these are the icons of what nature looks like in the Canadian cultural imagination. It's the pristine nature. It's the social media photographs with all these wonderful pictures. And think of the marvelous paintings by the group of seven, add in Emily Carr. It's this environment. Think of all those Christmas cards. And anyway, let me stop there. But race shows up there too, because all of these are built on the idea that nature is pristine. And pristine nature is our code word for avoiding the discussion that this is indigenous land and the parks were created by dispossessing indigenous people of the land. And the parks were created by white people, where most of the visitors are white people. So when I look at the parks and I spend a huge amount of time in these parks, what I also often see is that this is what white saviorism looks like in nature, in outdoor education. And when you go through those parks, still keep visiting them, but it's look at things like the heritage plaques. It's looking at the maps. Whose story do the heritage plaques tell? I saw a few today, and it's like, okay, here we go again. Whose story are they telling? and whose story are they erasing. There's a fifth way that race and nature are linked in outdoor education. Who goes camping? Yeah, <laughs> right? One of the rites of passage of being in Canada. It's a fundamental part of the mythology as Canada is a land of the great outdoors. And race shows up in camping too. Think of your camping trips. Who shows up? and just as important, who is absent. And for many educators, you send the permission slips home with the children to come on the camping trip, all the information is there, but it's not enough to engage black students or other racialized students. It takes energy, it takes resources to do a targeted outreach to those communities and to understand our complicated relationship with nature and the fear that for many black people is the foundation of our relationship with nature. For us, taking a walk in the woods, historically, black people who took a walk in the woods did not come out of the woods. And yes, those things are happening in the US, but there's a collective racial memory that black people in the woods, if something happens, where are my witnesses? Where do I run to? Outdoor educators need to understand that and to understand that's why permission slips are not enough. But you have to keep doing the trips. From my own research, I'm just finishing off my PhD right now. I'm writing up my topics on camping, hiking, and snowshoeing. And for many of the people that I interviewed, the trips that were done, the outdoor education trips, the activities in their lifetime, that was their only opportunity to try camping, snowshoeing, and they remembered some of those activities 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. And they remember the teachers who introduced them to the activities, so please keep doing it. But to sum up, race is part of the discussion in outdoor education. Don't avoid it, embrace it, don't run away from it. Think about what your race means when you show up in the classroom. White people don't like to see themselves as, ra as racialized. Other people are racialized. But when your students show up, they notice. And in places like Toronto, yes, I know Toronto, but in Toronto, people of color are the majority of the population. We're 55%. That means the students are 55% people of color. But when I go to the outdoor education spaces, what I typically see is 90% are white race is in the room whether or not we want to talk about it. But we have to talk about race because if people of color are not visiting the national parks, the provincial parks, who else is? 
if they think that nature is over there somewhere, it's a white people thing because the nature that I have in my little part of the city is one sickly little tree in a badly manta maintained park, then why should I care about the moose? Why should I care about the polar bear? Why should I care about the polluted river when those things are so far away from my daily reality, when my access to nature is my schoolyard or the street trees that I have? So as educators, we have to find a bridge so that students in the city, specifically racialized students, can make the bridge between if I can care for this little tree or this little garden bed in my schoolyard, it's much easier for me to say than, oh, I need to care about nature over there because I'm part of that. So we are educators. As messy, as uncomfortable as race is, we still need to do it. We need to talk about it. We can do this, and we will do this. Thank you. <laughs>